And now this is the break in physics. The break in physics is your capacity to observe, to be sentient. And then further, to have the willpower, which is really intention and attention, the willpower to look in a certain place at a certain time under the right context, okay? That choice to look, these are non-physical, this is non-physical phenomena. I'm trying to introduce you into the world of the non-physical matter reality because we'll get to that because further. Spigeria is why. Heaven on earth is why, but it is definitely a uh, never-ending process to expand the awareness. So this is this was this light uh, collapse. This collapse of energy from one state to another is a fundamentally non-physical alteration of matter, as we uh, defined. Uh, Determinism earlier is every event in reality having an antecedent event that precedes it. Well, this is, breaks that law of reductionism, which is the first law, because there is no physical antecedent for this change. This is a physical alteration. Excuse me, I shouldn't use that word here. It could be confusing. This is an alteration of the fabric of reality caused by a non-physical phenomena, you. I believe the saying was, in this world, not of it. And it is this alteration that has become popularly described as the wave particle duality. So I kind of already went into the science of it a, a little bit. But what they what what happened is that they said, okay, light exists as, as a wave until it is observed by a consciousness at which point some spooky uh, spooky action and occurs in the distance and the light wave instantaneously collapses into a white into a light particle so hopefully you can see the break in physics of course like physics is the study of physical things and there's no physical thing between the eyes and the light it's just a non-physical connection it's just awareness of something that is bringing about these changes in scientific material experimental data. You see the break in the physics, of course. An object tends to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside physical force. The force of observation is knowing. It is a fundamentally non-physical phenomena. And this, this non-physical phenomena of knowing, of awareness, is absolutely unreconciliable with Newtonian mechanics. It is this action, this instantaneous action at a distance that beguiled the greatest materialist scientist to ever live, Einstein. He made a dull note of the quantum universe and said, um, I think he just tossed it asunder he said, that's the quantum universe, that's spooky mechanics, that's spooky science. We don't know and we can't go down that alleyway because it's going to forever F us up. And so they didn't. He said, sort of like um, sort of like Newton did, he went on to describe the what and the, and the how of science. And he did this through the general theory of relativity. And without to get too much into the science of that... It basically states the relationship between uh, matter and what Einstein called space-time. And that defined the limits of our application of that understanding. And right, we're still doing great things because of it. We're going to the moon, we're inventing things, all sorts of things. People are still trying to really understand the relationship between matter and uh, the rest of reality, obviously. That's what we've been trying to do this whole time. Just understand what is matter. Why is matter? How is matter? So Einstein, the general theory of relativity, stated and defined 
the how and the why, oh gosh, the how and the what of matter. And the knowing that this theory fell short because of these quantum experiments and he can't, he can't reconcile, reconcile instantaneous action at a distance, how entanglement, how particles can share information, how one thing can happen over here and it can be instantaneously uh, um, recorded, we could say, in, uh, in another particle. It can share states um, with zero lapse in time, meaning a particle on this side of the universe and a particle on the other side of the observable universe can share the same information contained within them and share, they can basically communicate. These things are talking to each other and mirroring each other across the universe. This is what entanglement is. It doesn't necessarily have to be across the universe, but you can understand that if something happens within a certain amount of time, then you could say, okay, this thing could be across the universe and it could basically be instantaneous. And so, so knowing that, he's like, okay, obviously the general theory of relativity doesn't sum up all things. It sums up a lot, but it doesn't sum up all the things. So he went on to develop in the later, latter half of his life, the special theory of relativity. So now I've got the general and the special theory of relativity, a dualistic understanding, excuse me, I just need to take a breath. So you see the, the, these, this light, it messed with Einstein's head. He, um, the dualism of the world was reverberated through his experience. So he recognized the dualism of light and the fundamental nature of reality. And he, uh, I think he embodied it and he created it. So he created the general theory of relativity and then he created the special theory of relativity. So he's got this thing that describes the relationship between matter and space-time, and now he's got this thing, this special thing, that describes the relationship between light and space-time. So you see where the, where the separation between these two things happens. It really happens at different, what I uh, understand as focus levels, and these focus levels also contribute to the creation of different fields like the atomic field and the magnetic field and, um, you know, our, our quark fields and stuff. These are focus levels of reality. So Einstein is able to look at the objects in the world and how they're relatively oriented towards us, how matter is relative to the human condition, and explain that. And he it then does the same thing with light. How light relates and then he spent the rest of his life trying to reconcile these two um the, these two theories and he failed all up all the way up until his deathbed reincarnating the drama of of uh, newton he he, I mean, in his letters, he's got letters between other scientists of his time, Wheeler and Planck and Bohr, and, you know, they all come to these conclusions that um, you know, that the elementary nature, the hypostasis of reality is, you know, it, it, it it's not at all what we think it is. He, he realized later, I'll quote him, he says, one has to find the, uh, the possibility to avoid the, the space-time continuum altogether in order to come to a uh, factual understanding of reality, but I have not the slightest idea of what kind of elementary concepts could be used in such a theory, right? So he realized at the end that it was all messed up, that his theories, they don't explain what he wanted them to explain. And so we ask ourselves again, do we learn from the mistakes of others? No, we don't. We see that they're able to produce so much given their uh, limited understanding and 
we humans like to produce things and we like things and so we take it and we um we expound on it and we extrapolate every last bit of juice from these uh quote-unquote theories so like this seems to be, like I said, like the capstone of materialism, because at this time it was Einstein, Max Planck, and Niels Bohr, John Wheeler, David Bohm. They all started to come to this understanding that somehow consciousness plays a very fundamental role in, um, in the manifestation of reality and in the solution of the, the why. But they couldn't figure it out with their equations, they couldn't figure it out with their theories, they couldn't figure it out with their math. He says, even as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they're certain, they do not refer to reality. So you see, what we're living in really is a simulation, simulacra, simulacra. And that's just the idea that says the symbols and the words and the images and the the mediums of reference that we use to, reate, to relate to reality have become so far detached and abstracted from the way that reality is actually working with its hypostatic images, its hypostatic words, its hypostatic information, that the way we have been using these symbols and these, these paradigms these materialisms and these theories of relativity has actually been completely vacated of meaning and our react our actions in the world have been basically rendered meaningless now i think that is a very very important point so that we can grasp the um how would you say the the reality of the situation is that we need to drastically realign our perspective on the universe, our angles. We need to um, uh, explore some new angels and see how really we could warp our mental interpretation of reality to come into a more true and complete, uh, integrated and unified understanding because well because then we can stop living in this hellish realm and we can start living in a more heavenly existence so what else did they say what else did they say right so to say what i just said in a little bit of a different way einstein said the release of atomic energy has not created a new problem. It is merely made more urgent than necessity of solving an existent one. So, the result of being inundated with materialist, reductionist, scientist propaganda is the, the, the way we see, see the world now. We say, oh, we have science to thank for all these things. It's no doubt I'm living like a king. Look at these fine clothes in this air-conditioned house. However, we can't even handle atomic energy, you understand? If we can't handle atomic energy without pushing the clock, the doomsday clock, closer to midnight, then what makes us think that we could handle the Peloroma or the true origin of creation? So that's just kind of something to think about here as we move towards trying to understand the uh, origins of creation and the non-physical energies which really govern our lives and govern absolutely freaking everything that we do and don't understand. So this really is kind of like an, the immaturity of mankind, I like to say, because mankind, it's not mankind. Men are great. Groups of people are the worst. And, you know, there are some great men out there. And there are some fundamentally corrupt groups out there. 
which don't care about truth, they don't care about knowledge, they don't care about science, they don't care about nothing, about nothing. They just want to um, own and have and subjugate and control more. So it's just curious to me that so many laws can be created that directly incriminate an entity simply by their existence. Like some people are victims of corporate crime before they even brush their teeth in the morning. Some people are not victims, some people are criminals for growing something out of the ground that grows naturally in nature that God or nature, medu netter, offered to us. People are considered criminals just by um, having, well, they aren't considered criminals, they can't be tried for it, but we have compounds in our body that are schedule one substances. And if I was to go into my backyard and mix some flowers with some fluids and pull out the rest of whatever comes out of that precipitate, then I would go to jail for many, many, many years. So, and I mean, just like the, the, the first law of Newtonian mechanics, every single human being is breaking that law because it exists, but it doesn't exist. It's, it's a superficial imposition, an artificial imposition from some other unjust and illegitimate authority onto your ability to express and understand yourself, which is a, an absolutely, um, that is a, a, a demonic force in a way of manner of thinking. So any, any force which is restricting um, your unique capacity for infinite expression should ultimately be challenged. Its authority should be challenged and its uh, actions should be dismantled. So this is the dismantling of the the ineffective materialist paradigm. So it's, it's unfortunate. It's just unfortunate that they say, you know, this is the way the world works and you don't exist in this world, right? Reductionism implies delusion of the individual. If the universe is material and the universe is physical, you and everything you think you are is an illusion of your mind and does not exist. That's probably why they're able to control us so much because legally, legally, scientifically, we don't fucking exist. That's why they were killing everybody back then. Still doing it. Just not directly in front of us. So they lowered their, they lowered the under, they lowered the aims and goals of science, and because of that, we come into uh, all these different problems of of uh, in various sciences. Like in neurology, there's the hard problem, the binding problem. The hard problem is how does life Consciousness, how does consciousness arrive from non-conscious matter? How does animation occur from inanimate matter, right? The particles, the particles that they're calling, that they're studying through this model are not lifelike and they don't carry life. And so what chemical process has to be undergone in order to create this experience of I, of I am, of Nicholas Jensen Denton? of spagyracy, spagyria, spagyria, spagyria. That's the hard problem because they can't figure it out because they're locked in this materialist understanding, which I've been saying is fundamentally wrong. So further, this is the binding problem. You can get a little bit in the brain with understanding how chemicals interact and you say, okay, this portion of the brain is responsible for uh, your visual center. This portion of the brain is responsible for your smell. This portion is responsible for accessing short-term memories. Like you can get that, but even from there, 
at this focus, at this level, you can't say, okay, we've got all these portions of the brain that work together. How do we wire those together to create the experience of the I am? Now, you can't. It's a problem. The binding problem. They've been working at it since they started studying the brain, probably back in ancient Kemet. Well, since they started studying the brain materialistically, 1700s or whatever, they can't figure it out. The neurological mechanisms that allow for the arousal of a choice-making faculty within the consciousness that serves as an individuated aspect of the ego that separates what is distinctly about you and your choices from the influence of the environment and hereditary traits. So let me explain. You, it, it's a really good... I love when people come to me with words that their definition is everything I've been trying to figure out, right? And you're like, oh my God, there's this word that describes everything and all these questions and answers I've been working through. And so that word here is how spagyric, um, spagyric treatment, it's not treatment, spagyric, that, that term vitalism is how spagyria alchemy and holistic healing and whole being healing operates, okay? It is vitalism. Now, what is vitalism? Vitalism is the, it's another theory, right? These are all theories. This one makes a lot more sense though. It's a theory that says the fundamental life force, the, the fundamental principle of life is uniquely distinct and separate from chemical and physical interaction. That the life principle, what creates life, what creates the ego, the I am, the awareness, the sentience, the conscience, the consciousness, what creates all that stuff is different, detracted, um, separate from, not influenced by chemical means, okay? So now they're talking more about an omnipresent force existent through everything, not contained within anything, but it is everything. Sound familiar? Sounds a lot like gravity to me. So let's understand this life, but if that doesn't make sense, vitalism, understand it like, like this, like we could take the human being and push it through a machine, and that machine can map out every single electrical and cellular automata in the body from the tip of your hair to the bottom of your heel. And we could look at that on a live chart, and we could slow it way down. And we looked at this, rep this neurological, physiological, physical representation of the human system, and subjected this thing to like a maze to say, hey, here, express yourself, make a bunch of choices that would be unique to you. Make these choices and we're gonna look at your map of your body while you're making the choice to see where this um, choice occurs in the body. And what they found was that, big surprise, nobody could ever find it, ever. And humans and animals and anything the choice-making faculty, when something is presented with the capacity to go left or to go right in a maze, and you say, you probably don't say it consciously, you just do it, so I'm going to go left. There has never been, nor in my humble opinion, w will there ever be somebody who points out in the body, look, there's the choice. That's where they made the choice. That's where free will occurs. That's where the entity resides. Like they talk about the seat of the soul, like where is the highest density of conscious activity in the body? Is it right behind the eyes? Some people is down here, it's in your heart. Where is this choice? making faculty. It's not in the body. It's non-corporeal. It is non-physical. It is asomatic. Okay? 
in essence, you are a ghost and everything you perceive physically is a machine. This is a machine. This biological technology is a machine. And I'm a ghost. I'm like a big spirit in this. I am the gravity, right? I am the, the, uh, the ghost that has this body that operates this machine. I am the ghost in the machine or the machine is in me, the ghost. That's a better way to understand it, I think. So read between the lines, really. Physical reality is the lines. And it's important. It's important. Let's take, let's take a short detour here to talk about nature and relationships and energy and building communities, because that shit is the most important. Let's just, little, little quick lesson here. When you look into an atom, studying chemistry, I look into atoms. When you look into an atom, you ask yourself, when you look into an atom, you ask yourself, where is the energy in this thing? Where is the energy in this object? Is it in the nucleus? Is it in the protons? Is it in the electrons? Well, funny thing is that it's really not in any of those things. Those things would all be physical, of course, right? The energy is held in the bonds of the chemicals. And there's four different types of bonds, but the energy that is stored, the electrical energy, which can be transferred to any physiological system, a plant through photosynthesis or through the human body's mitochondria, the source of that energy The source, the, 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 the energy is stored in the bonds. So the energy of chemical, uh, the energy of chemicals, the energy of life itself in the physical world and in the spiritual world is contained in the bonds of chemicals themselves. And so let's upgrade that a little bit. Where is our energy? Where is our structure? Where is our potential at? Our potential, our energy is stored in our bonds, right? You, you are bonded with your family. You are bonded with your friends. You bond with people. Our common unity, our strength, our, um, uh, our, There's another word that's great that I can't think of right now. Our community's strength resides in the bonds that we create every single day throughout our life. And I just thought that was a better way to think about energy and where it comes from and the expression of willpower, etc., etc. So yes, that's that's vitalism. The willpower, the expression of energy, the bond is not a physical thing, you understand? The bond is the space between electrons as they're moving, which tethers together two atoms. So the bond between humans would be the informational theoretic and, and relation, uh, relative awareness of each other, basically. The relationships that we carry with people are our bonds. And so to create a more structured world, we really gotta work on our bonds.